Uh, obviously, we are not welcome by weather. <laughs> but, uh, um, let me um, introduce this event first before we begin. Um, it's called Second Joint International Methodology Research Colloquium, um, jointly held by Okinawa Jolt and Corpus C Korea Association of Teachers of English K Korea and Methodology C uh, of LET, Language Education Technology in Japan. Okay, so this is the second event because we had one last year in Korea, Seoul in Korea. So it's really amazing to get together again in Japan and then hopefully we have something else to have in the future. Right, and also we'd like to thank Okinawa Joel for holding this event together. It's really dynamic, you know, organization. It's really amazing to have you know, get together in Okinawa and talk about our research. Right. And uh, we have two days, uh, this is a two-day event, and uh, the first day we have um, I mean, nine talks, um, <coughs> three big, um, plan back-to-back, -back, like up until um, 5.30, okay. and on the second day we have a workshop by George McLean. So we have so many presentations and talks. Maybe we don't have much time for discussion, but you know we have a um, party after this today's event. So please come join us. Okay? And the first keynote speaker is uh, Dr. Hiratsuka Takahiratsuka of University of Syracuse. Okay, maybe. And he's the one who made this event possible. So please welcome joining me in Rampen. Thank you very much, Ms. Sensor. Hi everyone, my name is Takao Kiyasa. I'm currently working at the University of Ryukyu in Okinawa. I'm tremendously honored um, to kick off this event by presenting you a seminar on mapping the nexus of content research methods in TSOL. Just a couple of quick questions at the top. How many of you have conducted content research before? How many of you are intending to carry out content research in the future? Okay. Okay. How many of you wants to get a crowd of here, go to a beach cafe and have some beer right now? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I hear you. I hear you. Me too. Me too. <laughs> um, now, as part of a tradition of this methodology group, I'd like to first ask of the following very important and critical research question. How drunk was I last weekend? If I attempt to answer this research question, very serious research question, in a quantitative way, the answer might look like this. So I started drinking <coughs> at 9 p.m. last Saturday. The first one hour, I drank two pints of beer representing Nibu. And the second, second hour, the following hour, I drank three pints of beer, as well as uh, drugs of white wine represented in red, and so on and so forth. The bar graph shows the number of alcohol beverages consumed, and the learning chart illustrates the alcohol ingestion amount. As you can tell, the peak was from 11 p.m. to midnight, and as you can see, the alcohol percentage for each beverage at the bottom, con beer containing 5%, white wine including 14%, as well as alcohol being 25%, etc. That's enabling you to get a sense of the approximate alcohol content in my body accumulated over the course of six hours. According to the Japanese driving law, 
a blood alcohol content level of 0.03%, that is 30 milligrams, will result in an automatic DUI offense. That means that I was about 700 times more drunk than I could legally that drive that day. With descriptive statistics, the answer, that it looks like this. According to the Drink Awareness Organization in UK, we should not drink more than four pints of beer, that is 20 milligrams a day. Considering all of this with these data in mind, the answer to the research question, how drunk was I, in a quantitative way, would be I was 11 times more drunk than I should have. Now, if I were a qualitative researcher had and attempted to answer the same question, how drunk was I last weekend, the answer might look like this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened to here. Okay. Okay, sorry.
Qualitative research concerns at most with processes rather than products or outcomes. It clarifies to what extent, how, and why the participants come to understand their experiences, account for their practices, and take action in their settings in the way they, in the way they do. Last but not least, a qualitative study deals with how different people make sense of their lives. The crux of qualitative research is therefore construction, a co-construction co of meaning within a particular social setting. Some researchers even go back to their participants with their videotapes, audio tapes, um, drafts of research reports in order to understand the participants' meaning making more accurately. This is a strategy known as member checking in the field of quality research. So these are some of the characteristics of quality research. Now, in conducting quality research that includes these characteristics that I just mentioned, researchers need to choose a framework to guide their research. Overall, different scholars use different terms such as methods, uh, strategies, modes, types in their respective disciplines. In the field of TSA, this framework is often called approaches. There are only six of them that to which we can differ um, when we are conducting research, namely narrative research, phenomenological study, actual research, granular theory, ethnography, and case study. They are oftentimes overlapping and intertwined. But for the sake of brevity and convenience, I'd like to present and distinguish them as separate entities in this presentation. So let's take a look at each other. First approach of content research is narrative research. It aims to examine and understand the way people create meaning in their lives as narratives. Well, the size is not really correct here. It's not fit them to the screen there. I'm sorry about that. But I will explain this already, anyway. Um, so the outcome of which takes the shape of biography, autobiography, life history, personal experience story, oral history, etc. So the focus is on the story. That is, what the story is conveying, how the story is constructed, and why the story is told. There is an iterate engagement with uh, original events occurred. Stories told by the participants and stories presented by the research. This is an iterated engagement within these three different levels of factors, right? This is a core of narrative research, and this psychological meaning-making process is called narrative knowledge. If you are interested in rich stories told on a daily basis, you should refer to this approach, and now you are studying with it. The second approach I'd like to introduce is phenomenological study. This is an inquiry into a particular phenomenon that people have experienced. It aims to provide accounts of what the phenomenon looks like and how the phenomenon was perceived and experienced by the participants. For example, the phenomenon I experienced was drinking from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. last Saturday with my friends from soccer club in a city of the prefecture. I went through revolutionary changes due to the event, mentally, psychologically, cognitively, physically. 
physically and financially. <laughs> Explicating the transition and transformation from being completely sober at 9 p.m. to having drunk that drunk and become crazy would be the centerpiece of the research. So, the utmost focus is not on the stories conveyed during the interviews or how each participant remembered the event. Rather, what is investigated via this approach is what the phenomenon was and how the phenomenon happened. This, in turn, has a potential to tease out what it is like to undergo and experience the phenomenon for others. So it is helpful and beneficial for others who have never experienced the phenomenon. What would it be like to get drunk in Okinawa? You will soon find out with me tonight. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Next, I'd like to describe and discuss action research. This is a type of study primarily conducted by practitioners, such as teachers and students in the classroom, in the actual classrooms, not by researchers at research institutions, no, by practitioners. Action researchers pursue solving pertinent problems in their own classrooms via a spiral of actions, that is to say, First of all, developing a research plan. Second of all, acting according to the plan. Third of all, evaluating, um, the observing the effects of the action. And then lastly, evaluating the outcome of the, that action for further cycles. This is a cyclical activity. So infinitely, this will go on and on so that they will be able to solve the problems raised in the actual classrooms. <coughs> actual research is believed to aid teachers and students in becoming more autonomous and self-confident in different aspects of their work. This is an approach of, for, and by teachers and students at the grassroots level, thus enabling the traditional hierarchy to be inverted by putting teachers and learners on a higher level than outside researchers. I am passionate about this research because this can put an emphasis on the actual students and teachers in the classroom who know what is needed, what is required for an innovation of their education. And branches of actual research, for example, teacher research, practitioner research, experimental practice, is something I have done and I will continue to do. Moving on. The intent of Grandio Theory is to move beyond a mere description and generate a theory that is an analytic abstract schema of a process. There is no hypothesis usually at the outset of the research. And the data analysis is completely inducted. In other words, data data. If you are interested in building a field at the end of the research so that you can have an impact upon language policies or communities in a broader sense and contribute theoretically to the field of TSO. This is the way to go. The fifth approach with encoded research I'd like to explain is ethnography. Ethnography is a study of an entire cultural group and its analysis concerns shared patterns, behaviors, beliefs, and languages in the group. Typical ethnography requires 
researchers to immerse themselves in the community to understand the culture, everyday goings on, and so to speak, common sense in the context. Hence, intensive time and energy is required and invested by the researcher. Primarily, features of ethnography are observing the participants in their cultural, natural group and interview the members in the community. Preferably, more than 20 key informants in order to get a comprehensive understanding of the culture and community. We probably need 20 or more key informants to interview. There are different ways of conducting ethnography, one of which is called reality ethnography, where researchers do not closely engage with the practices or activities with the members of the community, but become distant observers. Another way of conducting uh, ethnography is called critical ethnography, in which Researchers seek to empower the minority members of the community for freeing them and for elevating their status by deconstructing the power imbalance in their shared circumstances. All right, lastly, case study. Case study has been defined in different manners by numerous scholars in a variety of disciplines. However, all the definitions of case study share at least one underlying similarity. Most definitions of case study highlight the bounded singular nature of the case, the importance of context, the availability of multiple sources of information or perspectives on observations and the in-depth nature of analysis. Similarly, for people, crucial elements of case study are the selection of the individual unit of study and the setting of its boundaries. Taken together, Concerning all of this, as long as a case or cases being studied can be bounded by a certain period of time and place in a certain context, a study, that study can be different, can be likely to be referred to as a case study. My earlier example, remember the earlier example I gave to you? My earlier example can be understood as a case study because the studied case myself was bounded by a particular time from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. on February 13th in 2016, as well as by a particular place at an izakaya in Okinawa. So that is a typical case of case study. These are six major approaches of coordinated research. Again, we can combine any of the two or more approaches depending on the purpose, feasibility, implications of the research as well as the research questions posed. <coughs> and we can use any of this to conduct coordinated research. It doesn't have to be fixated within these six different approaches. Okay, before I move on, and address qualitative data collection methods and qualitative analysis methods. I would like to take a short stop here for five minutes or so to see if there is any question thus far. Questions not directly related to the uh, issues raised up until now or the subsequent two for that matter are also welcome. Do you have any questions? If you have any questions or comments, um, you can just do that. Or at the end of this presentation, I will take um, 
Q&A session one more time, so you can uh, speak up at that time too. If you have a burning question you want to ask now, then I'll take it. So about the, the Igakara case. <laughs> um, if you're, what you're interested in is the, the, how much alcohol an average um, how much what? Uh, average alcohol yes, yes. consumption of yes, yes. um, Okinawa people. <laughs> yes, yes. And may, maybe taking the means to be okay. Yes, yes, yes. So it depends on your research question. Yes, yes, totally, totally. Yeah. How would you put the research questions? It would be the um, driving factor for the researchers to choose either coordinated or coordinated research, yes. Especially if you put the, you know, uh, form formulate your research question depending on how much or to what extent it would be peered towards the quantitative research but like if the research questions would start with why or how then it might be bounded to having the quantitative research questions yes so very impressive <laughs> <laughs> really, really it's not easy yeah, yeah no like I mean just really very good primer of what qualitative research Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I asked you to say that yesterday night, remember? <laughs> <laughs> good one, good one, yes. I, I'm wondering, like, um, does it mesh well with quantitative? Is it possible to mesh it? It's not even possible, but it's ideal uh -huh. to mix, have the mixed method met, um, approaches combining quantitative and qualitative because they have pros and cons, each of them. And then they can complement each other, having different aspects and uh, paradigms and from different perspectives. Mm. So yeah, it is not even uh, only possible, but it is very ideal and uh, recommended, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. So you said that some terms are used interchangeably, right? Yeah, yeah. So in, if you want to write a paper, mm -hmm. Um, it's quantitative research approaches. You have to you have to state at the, at the beginning of your paper that we, I used actual research or I, I, I used ground theory or is it necessary? Um, that's a good, good question. It depends on the um, rigor, rigor of the journals as well. And some journal editors would insist you clarify and put forth the which method, which apps approaches of the quantitative research you use and you have to write it down clearly in the articulate sense in the methodology section. But some researchers uh, or the journals wouldn't really um, care about that so much and you might not need to make it clear. But if you make it clear the approach you are using, not only would it be helpful for the readers, but researchers will be able to go back to the principles of that approach and then find out whether or not they are following that approach in an uh, appropriate way. So as a researcher, based on my personal experience, um, making it clear which approach you are using is actually a good idea. Not only for the publications, but for the uh, trustworthiness of your research. Yes. Any other questions? Should I move on? Oh, yes. Well, my question is related with the Isakaya journal. Mm. Um, yes. I, uh, I thought about qualitative research, but my always my problem was uh, the way to collect data. Because um, if you do it surreptitiously, without them knowing that you are um, taking their video, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. Uh, in America, that's going to be a big problem one, yes. with IRB. Yes. So I wonder um, how much is allowed in here in Japan? Or? Well, the thing is, like the rigor was um, our IRB or the ethical matters in the field of the language teaching at least I know in Japan is not strict. So we can basically deceive to some extent the participants of our research, which I don't want to do. But um, especially coordinated uh, research studies, we have to, we might sometimes delve into the uh, very sensitive experience of the participants. So, um, even though it is not systematically uh, rigorous in terms of ethical issues in the context of Japan when it comes to coordinated research, we should look out um, how the participants will be experienced and then they do not feel deceived by the participants. 
So it's very linear here in Japan. It's not much fast in your country. Is it okay to tell them later, like after? No, the no, it's a very good one. Beforehand. Well, some people do that, but um, <coughs> if Kari is speaking, it's really wrong. Because what happens it cannot be taken away from the experiences of the participants. So we should always, right ahead, at the top, should tell the participants that I'm recording this, or I'm videotaping this. Do you think you say that the purpose of taking? Purpose, yes. Purpose, and then why you're taking it, and uh, what is it, is it going to be used, and to what extent this will be used. Everything should be included, uh, not only orally, but also in the document. And then show it to the participants. It is an uh, ideal and I would say a uh, legitimate way to do it as quoted researchers, yes. Thank you. Um, can, can I move on to the remaining part of my presentation? So I'd like to look into uh, for the remaining part of my presentation the um, quoted data control methods as well as quantitative data analysis methods. Among the number of the coordinated data correction methods, what well, some call coordinated data correction techniques, um, interview techniques, individual interview and classroom observation are uh, commonly used in the field of HISO. I'd like to delve into that first. <clears throat> Sorry, the size is not really appropriate here, but again, I will explain orally. So. <clears throat> The most frequently employed and popular quoted research data correction method is the individual interviews. Interviews can probe the participants' perceptions and experiences, which are normally invisible to others. Sigmund um, maintains, as you cannot see, <laughs> interviewing may be less open or being carry if the research aim is to inquire into how teachers and students perceive their lives in their classroom. Although there is no one absolute interview strategy that fits all the situations, Simons recommends researchers utilize two strategies when facing their interviews. Firstly, researchers should form and maintain rapport with participants. It is apparent and obvious an interview is not one-way communication. Interviewers and interviewees co-construct the outcomes and results of the uh, interview, interview conversations. <clears throat> this one said, the researcher does not create, does not create the analytics, but instead participates in the creation. Secondly, Simons recommends that interviewers should listen to their interviews with attentive insight and a curious mind so that interviewers can properly capture the meaning of what is being compared. In this figure, in my view, researchers can display encouraging body gestures such as a smile or the nodding or eye contact. Researchers also can use action, for instance, ahas and okays, and lastly, in your silence, while the participants are organizing their thoughts. All of these strategies can lead to generating opportunities for the participants to effectively express their thoughts and their ideas. <clears throat> Another partner quoted data correction method is classroom observation. If quoted inquiry in education is about anything, it is about trying to understand what teachers and children do in the settings in which they work. This is exactly why it is critical for researchers to observe unmodified classes, unchanged classes not revised or not, not something changed. It has to be added as it is. <clears throat> so that the researchers can see, feel, 
and comprehend what the teachers and students are actually doing in their authentic settings. Researchers can do this either by playing the role of a complete observer or a participant observer. In observing classrooms, researchers can obviously use video cameras, tape recorders, and notepads. Some of the established schemas slash tools we can use in classroom observation in the field of TESOL are FOCUS, which was formulated by John F. Fancho in 1987, as well as COLT, constructed by Nina Sparta in 1987 also. Now, let's take a look at two more qualitative data collection methods, pair discussions and focus group discussions. <coughs> These two methods can contribute particularly to achieving effective teaching and learning. Professor Farah in Canada argues that fostering professional development can only be realized by constant examination of teaching and learning beliefs and classroom practices. As John Dewey remarked a long time ago, we do not learn from experience. Instead, we learn from reflecting on experience, right? In pair discussions and focus group discussions, <clears throat> teachers and students alike can reflect on what is actually happening rather than what they think is happening at the classroom level, classroom level by using video tapes and uh, video clips. <clears throat> Teachers and students can grapple with questions such as, what do we do in our lessons? How do we do it? What was read, spoken, heard, written, or presented in our lessons? We have to constantly ask this these kind of questions for being defective questions. Why do we do what we do, not in other ways? What is the result of our lessons? And perhaps most importantly, does our lesson lead to our student learning? In what way? Why? Why not? Through pair discussions, <clears throat> often, in coordination with our colleagues. We can mutually identify and examine aspects of practice that each teacher or learner alone might otherwise let go unnoticed. <coughs> with respect to focus group discussions, informal focus group discussion consisting of a small number, small number of people Oftentimes, four to ten people have been made use of for many years by researchers in order to collect data to efficiently gain knowledge about a particular topic or need. <clears throat> if, and this is a big if, focus group discussions are adapted in a culturally, socially responsive way, Individual participants in the group are likely to be able to speak in their own voices in order to express their thoughts and ideas as one of the group members. <clears throat> in addition, science indicates two more benefits of focus group discussions. First, and there that uh, the focus group discussion method allows researchers to get a sense of the degree of agreement on issues among group members. The focus group discussion method can also provide a means to cross-check the consistency of the individual's perspectives when used with other data production methods such as individual interviews. Considering all of this, Focus group discussion are uh, therefore an appropriate 
and bind this out to metal in the future. I have here over laid out <coughs> four chief quantitative data quality methods. In the general discussion, observation, we have discussions and focus group discussions. Now, it is time for us to take a look at the final topic of my presentation. Data correction analysis method. <coughs> Qualitative data analysis methods. Data correction and data analysis are closely interlinked and they impact on each other equally. Researchers need to have sharp insight into how to analyze data before, during, and after its correction. First of all, a few words on transcribing, translating, and analyzing data. For transcribing and translating interviews and discussions, we need to make every effort to maintain the meaning of the appearances of the participants. Part of our actualizing it is to choose an appropriate transcript convention depending on the purpose and the level of the transparency needed for the research. We determine if cleaned up discourse from the original is enough, or a more detailed information is of necessity. This is an example of what I mean by cleaned up business. <clears throat> so it's a little bit too small, but um, basically all the pauses, for starters, overlapping and other extraneous information are omitted in this transcript. This level of transcript is used when writing manuscripts for publication. <clears throat> and this is a more detailed level of transcript convention. Conversational analysis use this. Or even a more detailed level of transcript convention. Now, with the large amount of data that coded researchers tend to acquire, like this, they have a challenging but illuminating task of listening, watching, reading the data over and over again repeatedly in order to reduce the data to manageable units and pieces for further analysis. <coughs> in following this lengthy trial, quantitative researchers usually engage in employing the research strategies called coding and categorizing. You might have heard of these terms, coding and categorizing, but it is very um, unclear as to how to exactly go about coding and categorizing. So I will give you a try and explain the process of these research categories step by step. Although, in the actual practice, it's not step by step. The strategies are not as straightforward or linear as I illustrated here, but I already did five. At any rate, coding consists of two, at least two stages. The first stage of data analysis, the coding data analysis, is called initial coding where each word, line, and segment of the data is named and presented like this. So this is the transcript. The second stage of coding is called either focused coding or selective coding, where Number several often repeated and salient initial causes are sorted, synthesized, integrated, and organized in order to create a fewer numbers of fewer number of codes, like in this example. I know this is messy. But our cognition, our practices 
thinking and behaviors are always messy. It's not linear, it's not uh, fixed, it's not stable, it's always organic and fluid, right? So the coding process is also messy like this. In consequence, sets of focused codes create several categories and eventually a conceptual framework, in other words, a theory. In many cases, the quoted research finishes here. In terms of the data analysis part, what we need to do, to do is to use data display through figures in order to represent how each category is interrelated, like this. And this is, by the way, called the theorizing. And the theorization, in my opinion, is the ultimate goal of any of the coordinated research study. So, I have so far mapped out in this presentation several characteristics of coordinated research. Major approaches, solid data collection methods, and analytic procedures. Due to the time limitation, I cannot deal with it the discussion on qualitative research about theo theory, theoretical aspects or the philosophical aspects that concerns, for example, epistemology or a paradigms. Neither could I discuss the evaluation of qualitative research that has to do with um, trustworthiness or validity and so on. There's also a heated debate about the usage of technology in the field of TESOL. For example, the use of qualitative analysis software and demo has been widely used and widely recognized. All of these are important and critical knowledge and context in light of becoming a more informed and well-rounded qualitative researcher. We need to move forward our field of second language acquisition as well as second teacher language education in this direction so that we can have a richer field of discussion. With that, in concluding my presentation, I'd like to acknowledge my gratitude to Sumi Sejo Sensor at Kansai Gakuin University whose work on quality research was so inspiring. My special thanks are due also to Ms. Modas Sensei and uh, all of my colleagues at the University of Ryukyu for making this presentation possible. Thank you very much, and I'll take some questions and uh, comments now. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions or comments? <clears throat> Yes. Thank you for the very nice presentation. Um, you mentioned about the informal focus group discussion, and um, how much should the participants understand the importance of having the interview? How much the teacher should explain that they have to take it seriously, and um, what is the goal of their focus group discussion? Yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, in the usual way, when we have the focus group discussions, at the beginning there is a moderator or the researcher explaining the purpose and the goal of the focus group discussions and probably sometimes the rules for turn taking. So um, in the first language, I would recommend um, participants would be informed of all of that. And um, um, in addition to the, what I can add for that description is that Moderators, depending on the role of them, but um, if I were to conduct a focus group discussion, I would also cut in and then uh, mitigate the, um, some of the deficiencies or shortcomings of focus group discussions as a moderator. For example, some of the students might not want to speak up in front of the peers. In that case, the moderators will be able to uh, encourage that particular person who has been remaining silent to speak up. Or if somebody is dominating the conversation 
and basically encouraging other group members to follow him or her, then I might, as a moderator, discourage him or her to tone down and speak a little bit less in a conservative way. Um, in that kind of, uh, I think, um, sort of uh, contribution is necessary from the point of the moderators and uh, researchers. Do you uh, do you find that time plays a big role in when you do your interviews? Like if you interview your students, like yeah, if you do if you interview your students, for example, and it's during the semester, uh, do you find that what they say oh, absolutely. maybe absolutely. a little bit different as compared to oh yeah, the absolutely. Um, in terms of time duration, I guess students were younger participants should be limited to less than one hour because of the ten, uh, attention span. Um, and also even adults like... Sorry, uh, sorry to uh, cut in, but... Uh, what oh, I meant, the, what the I timing meant, of the interview. Yeah, what I meant was yeah. like during... during yes, yes, yes. I thought you were talking about the duration of the interview. But okay, the timing of the interview. Definitely. There's this study I conducted where I found the participants were saying different things, completely different things, at the beginning of the interview and then the, in the end of the interview. That goes to show that if in, you interview some participants, the same participants, at one time in a year and then different time in a year, the outcomes of the interviews will be completely different. That's why we need to have this engagement of interviewing the same participants over and over again in a longitudinal way. So yes, the short answer to your question is yes. There will be different um, conduct. <coughs> yeah, um, um, I have a, a question about the reliability of the uh, interview test. No, um, okay, um, do you think that the uh, result of the interview test is reliable? I mean, I've conducted a lot of interviews, but I find myself guiding their answers. They are likely to show what they are expected to say, even when I'm a passive listener. So I am kind of skeptical about the, the result of the interview test. Okay, um, first of all, I don't, in terms of the reliability, I do not really want to use that term just because I am situated in the constructivism, interpretivism um, paradigm. I'd like to rather use the term of uh, dependability. And in 10 years, it's not my goal, the core quantitative research goal is not for um, completely repeating the same um, research but that research will be informative for other people, not necessarily to repeat the same questions or repeat the same interview. So uh, from the point of the dependability, I think, <clears throat> yes, the, especially there is a power balance between interviewers and interviewees, just like you mentioned, in terms of the teachers and the students. Students might want to say something you want to hear, so I always say to my uh, participants, if they are my students who are close to me, that I want to hear what you want, you think, irrespective of what I know or what I think. So um, making sure and then making them uh, very comfortable in participating in the interview is the foundation of the interview research method. And definitely, I think there are many studies exemplified with the uh, problems being participants are saying something the interviewers want to say, who want to hear. So that's very difficult. But the, my suggestion to, to that kind of case is to build rapport and relationship in an honest and true way. So that's the idea. I always try to uh, make myself feel very really happy. So, yeah, that's their answers. Or, or another strategy you might be able to use when that happens is you can be vulnerable. You can probably show your weak points and share your weak points or the disadvantage or the uh, shortcomings of yourself with your students so that they can comfortably um, put forward their thoughts in an authentic way. Now, I sometimes do that, but uh, it might work without any students. Thank you very much for your question. Um, yeah, after finishing uh, quite recently a number of surveys for using quantitative methods, uh, dependability or reliability, whatever you want to call it, I mean, 
I, I noticed there were a few <coughs> flat lines where the students just, you know, three, 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 oh. all the way through. Yeah. So I think it's a question. <laughs> that's that's sort of, what I don't like about it. I can't scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's, you know, so any sort of form of where you're trying to get this feedback, I think uh, you're going to have problems, whether you want to call it dependability or reliability. Uh, you published something last year that I thought was really quite interesting. Uh, the narrative frames, I think it was, as another form of that type of inquiry. I mean, with if especially if that was anonymous, I think it would yield a huge amount of data. It might be something you want to share with people. Right. Um, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I did this research um, with regard to the uh, narrative frames, which is a skeletal form of uh, um, writing task that students could engage in. And um, I asked my students using narrative framework um, to share their experiences of English language learning and teaching in the in English classes of my class. But the, the unique feature of that narrative framework is that students don't have to write their names and that they can freely talk about their experiences and um, true and maybe authentic thoughts and ideas. Another um, sort of element I put into that study is to bring the third party who can analyze the narrative data without me knowing the content of the uh, narrative responses. So maybe, the, it doesn't happen face-to-face -face in interviews, but maybe if you are collecting qualitative data through narrative frames or that kind of response <coughs> papers, you might be able to bring another party from outside of the class so that there is no uh, preconceived notions or bias or prejudice towards the researcher or the, towards the participants and then that could be sort of objective enough and then it could be a safe blanket for the participants to join the research. I'm out of time. Okay. <laughs> comment on a very small thing. And I am a quantitative researcher, yep. strongly biased. <laughs> but from this viewpoint, let me point out that you are an example for quantitative data analysis you presented as a very fast information about how, how drunk was that. Because it doesn't necessarily represent currently dominant quantitative mm -hmm. research method. Well, I'm not a no expert on no quantitative research. Yeah, that was kind of a part of a joke yeah, in yeah, my presentation, so I'm not. I know that, but let me point out that uh, quantitative researchers like me want to take a blood sample and carefully examine the chemicals in the blood. Or another type of quantitative researcher may, may uh, <coughs> make a diagnostic system with lots of questionnaire items using a large scale survey. <laughs> These are what quantitative such as do, and so for me, it's simply observing the amount you know, of alcohol taken in a fixed time it is rather a qualitative, qualitative <laughs> research method, not a quantitative. So my point is, we don't know where it's a borderline between them. Well, there is a continuum, of course. One being the qualitative, and then the other being quantitative. And there is um, this scholar at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, James Brown. He is coming to the Georgia National Conference in October, and he talks about the continuum between the qualitative and quantitative. The strength of the, as I explained earlier, is a complementation of qualitative and quantitative. And I do agree that there is a blur line between quantitative and qualitative, but I use that term for the sake of convenience and brevity. Do you, do you recommend us to, to conduct a mixed message? Oh, yeah, I do. Okay, thank okay. um, you. The theory, theory part, yes. if someone has a problem with that result, then that brings that, that uh, problem. Mm -hmm. so, so how would you, what would you do that? Well, the thing is, like, um, we cannot satisfy everyone. And this is one case. And this is particular to the particular context. And this came out of particular methods and particular uh, stance I have. In so this is no, in no way um, an answer 
in an abstract way, in a natural scientific way, to um, the, all the generalizable results. And then I'm pretty sure some people would not agree with it. But then I recommend they do the similar studies so that they can contribute to this theorizing part um, in the particular study for a particular ne uh, necessity of the research. And what I want to point out through that theorization is to enhance the trans transferability for other researchers and participants in different contexts to see what, to what extent they, these features of theorization can be applied to their own context. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.